Well, we've got another fascinating afternoon session for you, uh, and uh, the format for the next three days will follow the one today where we'll have our bipartisan policy center issues panels uh, in the afternoon. And so I'm going to uh, introduce uh, again to the podium your faculty director to introduce our moderator and uh, who will in turn introduce our panelists for you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Mina Bose. Welcome back. I was just speaking with our panelists about um, our discussion of healthcare before 11 o'clock and um, a lot to cover on what the new Congress, uh, new opportunities and challenges will bring. So without further ado, let me introduce our panel moderator, uh, John Michael DiCarlo, who's a policy analyst uh, with the Bipartisan Policy Center. He joined the center last spring and is a member of the Health Innovation Initiative. Um, Mr. DiCarlo brings a background in biotechnology, health privacy, and medical innovation policy across both private and nonprofit sectors. He previously worked at the American Action Forum on uh, drug development and the medical device excise tax. Um, and he, uh, his work delivered insights on regulatory issues for lawmakers on Capitol Hill. Mr. DiCarlo is from Buffalo, New York, so this snow probably is nothing, uh, <laughs> particularly given what Buffalo has seen this year already, and um, received his master's degree in American Studies from California State at Fullerton, uh, previously graduated Phi Beta Kappa from SUNY Buffalo, also in American Studies. Please join me in welcoming Mr. DiCarlo, who will introduce the panelists. Thank you. Can everybody hear me? Is this, this is on? Okay. Uh, first, I'd like to take a second to uh, thank the Washington Center uh, for having us. Um, this is a particular issue that, uh, you know, at BPC, which Ashley is going to get into a little bit more, but um, is uh, true to our heart, um, and it's something that I've been working in for just about five years now. Um, so without further ado, I'll start uh, to my immediate left uh, is Ashley Ridlon. Um, Ashley has over a decade of health poly experience at the federal level. Um, she is now working as Senior Manager at the Bipartisan Policy Center's Advocacy Network, uh, where she leads health and economic policy advocacy um, and provides political and strategic advice to BPC leaders and staff, including myself. Um, Ashley has also worked at CMS, um, as well as um, spent uh, five years as a health policy advisor to Senator Blanche Lincoln, who was a member of the Senate Finance Committee, um, and she worked for home care and hospice organizations before that. Uh, to her left is Sarah Eggy. Uh, Sarah has been with uh, Washington Council Ernst & Young since 2012, uh, and has extensive policy and legislative experience and a wide range of federal legislative and regulatory issues, uh, which can include healthcare, entitlement reform, budget, tax, appropriations, social security, and transportation issues. Um, so there's really not much left out there. Uh, I never did that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, prior to uh, Washington Council Ernst & Young, uh, Sarah served as the lead health and entitlements analyst for the Democratic staff of the Senate Budget Committee uh, during her 12-year stint. She worked extensively on key legislation, including the Affordable Care Act, the Statutory Pay-As-You-Go Act, the Deficit Reduction Act, um, and also served as a key advisor to Chairman Kent Conrad of North Dakota during his participation with the uh, National Commission on Fiscal Responsibility and Reform, also known as the Bulls-Simpson, and Gang of Six Budget Negotiations. Um, even more impressively, she was selected by Co-Chairman Patty Murray of Washington State to serve as the Deputy Staff Director of the Joint Select Committee on Deficit Reduction, also known as a Super Committee, where she helped committee members navigate the complex issues and trade-offs associated with significant deficit reduction. So um, our panelists offer extensive insight uh, and experience that um, you know, I'm pleased to, uh, to present. Uh, the purpose of the panel today is to discuss the Congressional Agenda on Healthcare, where we've been, and where we're going, um, and what the 114th Congress may go on important, on important issues, such as 
health insurance coverage in the Affordable Care Act, uh, Medicare and the Children's Health Insurance Program, or CHIP, and uh, uh, area that's true to my particular interest, uh, the oversight and regulation of various industries and technologies in healthcare. Um, so before we get into this discussion, um, I'd like to turn it over to Ashley to provide a brief overview of BPC's health policy program. Ashley? Sure. Thanks, John Michael, and uh, thanks very much um, for, uh, for inviting us to be here today. Um, BPC has really enjoyed its relationship with the uh, Washington Center and um, just wanted to make sure that you're aware that we do have a health uh, program at BPC, and it's broken into three major parts. Um, one of those is health prevention, uh, formerly known as the Nutrition and Physical Activity Initiative, so um, that kind of gives you a sense of what is involved in that initiative. Uh, we also have a, um, our Health Innovation Initiative, which John Michael is a part of, uh, that focuses on health IT and technologies to improve care. Um, also, our Health Project, which is really um, the sort of um, initial project at BPC, um, and in one core piece of work that that project has developed, and we're in the second phase of that right now, um, is our healthcare cost containment initiative. Um, so I just want to highlight that because I think we'll talk about that a little bit today. Um, how do we um, how do we control costs in um, in healthcare, uh, bring down healthcare spending, uh, while improving quality and value in healthcare? Uh, so we have a very uh, comprehensive proposal um, that we put out in April of 2013. Um, that effort was led by former Senate Majority Leaders Tom Daschle and Bill Frist, as well as uh, former CBO and OMB Director Alice Rivlin, uh, that's the White House Budget and the Congressional Budget Offices, um, and also former Senator Pete Domenici. So um, we had kind of the budget perspectives coming together with the healthcare perspectives to come up with a really comprehensive proposal. Um, what we're doing right now is taking that into a little bit more um, in the weeds, um, sort of what's going on right now to improve care and lower costs um, and what could we be doing more of. So we'll be releasing some new papers in January uh, very soon. So um, we, will, we can talk a little bit more about that and also how that relates to what's going on on the Hill. Um, it's not all Affordable Care Act, although a lot of this does tie into Affordable Care Act. So, um, so we can talk about that some more. Great. Thanks, Thanks Ashley. Uh, so to start us off, um, let's discuss some of the highlights of the past year. Um, particularly what Congress accomplished on health care. Um, so I'll leave it to the panelists. Yeah. I'm happy to kick it off. So 2014 was a very interesting year in the healthcare space in that we didn't actually accomplish a lot. If you are measuring by the measuring stick of legislation that made it across the finish line and was signed into law by the President of the United States. But a lot of activities that occurred in 2014 really set the stage for potential action uh, in the 114th Congress, uh, also set the stage for the presidential election debates that are already sort of starting to gear up um, in the, at least at the primary level, um, right now. So a couple, couple of highlights that I would mention. Um, first, how many of you are familiar with the Medicare Physician Payment program known as SGR, Sustainable Growth Rate. Raise your hand, because then I know that I can talk at a very high level about this. Okay, we have one person who knows, <laughs> two people who know what SGR is. Okay, we have a very outdated Medicare physician payment system in this country, and uh, there has been a lot of interest in reforming it. It hasn't been reformed since 1997. And, uh, you know, every, every year we have to come along and patch the SGR system uh, in order to make sure the physician payments are cut by 21%. Um, in sort of a remarkable effort in bipartisanship and bi bicameralism, um, the three major committees, two in the House, one in the Senate, actually came together and introduced joint legislation to reform the SGR program. And while it sounds like not a big deal, well, all you did was introduce legislation, you didn't even attempt to pass it through the House or the Senate, why is that such a big deal? It has been many years. In fact, it was the first time there had been a markup in any of the major committees that had happened in a bipartisan way in either chamber on health care since 2009 when we took up the Affordable Care Act, or Obamacare, for whoever in the crowd is, uh, refers to as Obamacare. So remarkable that that legislation was introduced. It will be interesting to see how it moves forward in the coming Congress, because we've got a lot of change over in terms of uh, chairman and ranking members. Another uh, hot issue that uh, 
a lot of groundwork was sort of laid um, for potential legislative action in 2015 was this whole concept of 21st century cures. There's a lot of interest in reforming the FDA and the NIH processes to sort of uh, accelerate the process between the discovery of potential cures, the development into cures, and then getting that to the marketplace. And that involves potentially making some streamlining to the processes that, that go on at NIH and FDA. It also um, potentially will require some additional spending. A um, lot of hearings, a uh, lot of white papers, a lot of round tables, a lot of stakeholder discussions happened in the House. Uh, Democrats and Republicans participated in both of those. Uh, the House, key House committee that's working on that, the Energy and Commerce Committee, is already talking about potentially putting out a draft piece of legislation, perhaps marking it up before Memorial Day recess, getting it through the House floor. Uh, folks in the Senate are talking about the same thing. So a lot of groundwork laid um, last year on that issue. What about on the ACA? So did anything happen in the ACA? I know Liz Fowler was in here earlier this morning, uh, sort of regaling you with some stories about the political trade-offs of, of the ACA. Uh, and to be honest with you, you know, both sides have been in a protracted uh, debate now about whether to make changes, should we repeal it altogether, um, where do we take this piece of legislation from here. And I think both sides would, would agree that there are many flaws that either need fixing or repealing altogether. A um, couple of very minor fixes were actually included in the big uh, continuing resolution omnibus, which people inside the belt we referred to as the Crumnibus that passed last December. They made some very teeny tiny minor changes uh, to the uh, ACA and took a significant amount of negotiation. One notable change, for example, is expat plans are now exempt from requirements under the ACA. This is, you know, people who, you know, employers who are buying health insurance coverage for their folks who go overseas. Now they're exempt um, from the ACA. That took an intensive amount of negotiation between Republicans, um, Democrats, the White House, finally made it through, and perhaps shows us a pathway for making some small minor changes in this Congress before we talk about some more wholesale changes that might come after the Supreme Court decision in the summer um, or you know, a new presidential administration comes into place. So those are just a couple of things that come to my mind. Ashley, do you want to sure. jump in? Sure, no, I think you covered it. I mean, I think what I hear um, Sarah talking about in, in terms of, um, you know, there weren't a lot of things that got across the finish line, but there was a lot of good bipartisan, um, at least more than we've seen in a while, mm -hmm. uh, bipartisan collaboration. And, and that was true of, we call it the tri-committee bill because it was the Finance Committee, the HELP Committee in the Senate, uh, Energy and Commerce Committee, and the Ways and Means Committee um, in the House, uh, sorry, uh, it wasn't help, it was finance, ways and means, and energy and commerce um, on the Medicare payment. And um, it's, it's a massive bill. It's a $150 billion bill, depending on how you slice or dice it. Um, and that was a big part of uh, why the negotiations took a long time and were pretty monumental. And, and actually, the, the reason they were able to get to um, some bipartisan consensus was they said, you know what, we're going to have to agree to take uh, how we pay for this bill off the table um, and talk about the policy, uh, not just how we're going to pay physicians, which uh, Sarah talked about in 1997, you know, the whole impetus for the SGR, the so-called sustainable growth rate, was to keep physician payment in check uh, and to not let it get out of control. But of course, Congress, you know, when it, they're faced with having to cut physician payment um, and the doctors come knocking on the door and say, you know, wait a minute, um, it's really hard politically to make those cuts. And so year after year after year, we have made these patches, and every time it gets more and more expensive because that initial savings was built into the budget baseline. So, um, so you know, I think there's a lot of agreement that you need to address it in a long-term way. We don't wanna keep putting these patches on, this is ridiculous. Um, but we also talked about not just um, filling the hole of uh, physician payment and kind of making them whole, uh, but also uh, bringing payments more in line with, and this is some of what BBC is focused on, um, how do we pay for outcomes in healthcare more, uh, value, coordinated care, um, and, and not uh, paying more for just more volume, more services, fee-for-service. 
Um, this doesn't do, um, this creates some incentives to move more in the direction of, um, you may have heard of uh, primary um, medical homes, patient-centered medical homes. Um, that's one of the concepts, one of the new models of care that has talked about a lot. Um, also accountable care organizations, that's another model that's gained some ground. Um, with mixed results, there are some out there that are um, producing some really great results in things like keeping patients out of the hospital or um, from having a medication error um, and saving money. Um, and then there's some that are not saving as much money. So um, there's some, and that's what we will, we'll put out some recommendations on those models of care. Um, so we think the, the tri-committee bill um, was a great step forward and, and put some payment incentives in place to, to provide better care um, and hopefully save money. But the bill, you know, I think that those payment changes wouldn't have, um, it's not a groundswell of savings in the Medicare program. Um, and we think that you could do more uh, to, to reduce costs through better care. You don't want people to skimp on care. So I mean, I think that's really the, the divide here. You have to focus on quality as well as, um, as, well as cost savings. So we talk a lot about value. Um, so it was encouraging. Um, you know, the, the HELP Committee in the Senate and the e Energy and Commerce Committee in, in the House also, you know, they passed a, a number of sort of smallish bills, like reauthorizations, and I think they have a history, especially HELP Committee, of, of pretty good bipartisanship. Um, you know, Finance Committee and Ways and Means, where you have these big bills that you have to pay for, it's a little tougher. Uh, but we saw some bright spots. Great, thank you. Um, so I'd like to touch a little bit more on the SGR and the Medicare Physician Payment. I mean, you, you both alluded to why it's sort of been elusive. I was sort of hoping like you could touch on why it's important and sort of like broaden its context to sort of like what it means for more broadly like entitlement reform. Yeah, I, I mean, a couple of observations. First of all, I, I think you, will, you won't find a Democrat or a Republican who will disagree with the statement that the Medicare physician payment system needs to be scrapped and we need to start over um, with something else. Oh, or at least build upon and improve the existing system in some way, shape, or form. Um, I think there are a lot of people who also feel strongly that um, reforming the Medicare physician payment system is sort of the key to getting to that next step of delivery system reforms and entitlement reforms. Until you sort of start over fresh with the physician payment system, it's hard to make that next move to make some substantial reforms that will further sort of rein in healthcare cost growth um, in the Medicare program. So that's sort of an overarching theme that you hear over and over again when people talk about reforming the, the Medicare uh, physician payment system. But there are some big stumbling blocks to getting this done. And the stumbling blocks don't necessarily have much to do with the policy behind changing the Medicare physician payment system. Um, you know, as we kind of discussed, there's broad sort of bicameral bipartisan support for fixing this, and there's now an approach that most agree with. The challenge is the cost to fixing the Medicare physician payment system. So we have been in sort of a protracted era now since the mid-2000s of um, big concern about looming budget deficits. Um, you know, and the biggest driver of you know, the deficits on a going forward basis is the increasing sort of per capita spending growth in healthcare spending. So whenever we talk about doing something about a healthcare spending related problem in Congress, we usually end up having a conversation about, okay, and how are we gonna pay for that? So, you know, Liz probably talked earlier um, today about how when we were, you know, pushing the Affordable <coughs> Care Act through, Democrats decided it was a very important tenet that the whole thing had to be paid for. In fact, it didn't just have to be paid for, it actually had to reduce the deficit by conventional CBO scoring methods. Well, not only over the 10 years, but sort of like in perpetuity, which is how we got some key provisions in there, like the Cadillac tax, for example. Um, that's also why there are 700 plus billion dollars of Medicare spending cuts that were included in the Affordable Care Act. People don't often talk about that, but something that was included. Same thing is true for the Medicare Physician Payment Bill. Um, this legislation, 
which originally, to, to replace uh, the, the, the system, would have cost about $300 billion five years ago. The cost has actually now been cut by more than half, simply because Medicare spending growth has slowed down. Um, but still, you're talking about a price tag of $150 billion. Where are we going to cut health care spending to help pay for that? We're in a budget environment where we're not doing a lot of spending-related things that aren't paid for. Um, you've got a very activated um, health care sector outside of the physician space that's making sure they're not on the chopping block, whether we're talking about the pharmaceutical industry, hospital systems, post-acute care providers. Nobody wants to be on the chopping block because a lot of people feel like they were already chopped as part of the pay force for the Affordable Care Act. So when you look at what's the biggest stumbling block, it really all revolves around how are we going to pay for it. I would also layer on top of that that there's been a long debate since you know the economic downturn about the need to rein in deficits, right? And to not just slow spending growth down, but to actually cut the deficits and reduce the debt. Healthcare spending cuts tend to be sort of you know the number one issue that people want to look to to help reduce the deficit. But if you're using that to pay for fixing the physician payment system, you haven't reduced the deficit, now have you? So this has been like a conundrum that keeps coming up over and over again and is why we keep kicking the can down the road by and large. There's also a big, um, you know, a discussion around um, balancing offsets. So, you know, if you're going to, maybe you can cut a couple of different types of providers, like they'll cut home health payments or they'll cut dialysis providers or nursing homes or whatever they think um, you know, based on, say, um, there, there's a, an independent commission called MedPAC, the Medicare Payment Advisory Commission, um, that sometimes puts out recommendations that says, hey, you know, we think these for-profit hospices are making too much money and you should cut hospice or, you know, you should cut some other sector. Um, sometimes Congress will look at MedPAC or they'll look to other types of recommendations to, to think about where to cut, but that only takes you so far. Um, there's only kind of so much, like, like Sarah said, that you can squeeze and people feel like they've already been squeezed. Uh, so then, well, you know, what do you do? Can you change the Medicare benefit that seniors are receiving? Um, and if you start to, to, you know, let's say, charge seniors more for yeah. their Medicare. I was gonna say, and what Ashley's really saying is um, charging Medicare beneficiaries more, potentially yeah. restricting their choices, or another way of looking at it, incentivizing them to use evidence-based medicine yeah. and avoid, you know, certain procedures or what have you or use generics rather than brand name drugs. And there was a couple ways you could probably do it with not a whole lot of pain and you know maybe there's some good policy rationales like incentives. So uh, but it always becomes really contentious when you know then politically and optically it looks like oh we're pitting you know healthcare providers against beneficiaries and it's against seniors that are on the Medicare program. You know and then it becomes this war against the the various people who might be on the table for for cuts. So and then, of course, there are those who would like to go outside the Medicare box to look for offsets. Well, why can't we cut Medicaid spending, for example? Or why can't we rein in those health care, you know, premium tax credits that you created in the ACA as an offset? And that opens a whole new can of worms and brings out different opponents. So you can see how this has become um, a difficult problem to fix. So leading into the ACA, um, since, you know, that seems to get most of the media attention um, and our audience is probably most familiar with some of the, the arguments that have been going on there. Um, you know, today is the first day of the, of the new Congress uh, in session and so with all the slew of, of changes in leadership um, and a new Republican majority in the Senate, um, I was sort of hoping you both could shed some light on, you know, what are some of the votes on the Affordable Care Act that are coming up soon? Um, you know, votes to repeal the law, but, um, you know, one such change that's particularly within the past few weeks been talked about is how it defines full-time employees. Um, and so I was hoping if you could both shed your perspective on, you know, the Democrats and Republicans' viewpoint on that. Um, yeah, why don't I... Yeah, I'll, I'll just start off and Ashley just jump good. in whenever... Um, um, so a couple things. So uh, I think the, both the speaker and the leader made clear that uh, early on there are going to be uh, there's going to be a vote in both chambers to repeal 
the Affordable Care Act. Now, the House has already taken that vote upwards of 40 or 50 times now. Um, but, you know, the new <laughs> newly elected members who feel strongly about that want their opportunity to, to be on the record with that vote. In the Senate, there has not been a vote yet to repeal the ACA. So this will be the first opportunity for everybody to, to sort of have that debate and have that discussion robustly. Um, but in the House, at least, before we even get to the let's repeal the ACA, there has been some interest from Republicans in trying to get a couple of small little ACA fixes across the finish line first, see if we can get it to the president's desk and demonstrate that you know we're working in good faith and you know we can govern um, as you know, newly elected leaders in the House and the Senate. So the first thing, the first piece of legislation that's going to attempt to make a change to the ACA that's going to be up in the House, we're hearing as, as early as Thursday of this week, is a change to the employer mandate. So a little history on the employer mandate, Liz might have already touched on this in her earlier conversation, but uh, when Democrats were working on the ACA um, and were you know, making this reformed health insurance market in the individual marketplace and allowing for certain you know, individuals, certain income ranges, to have tax credits to help pay for that, there was a lot of concern that employers were going to come along and just dump employees altogether and sort of, you know, employer-provided health insurance would, would go away over time. And that was obviously going to have a significant impact on the cost of the bill. And as I mentioned previously, people were very concerned about the cost of this bill and making sure they kept it under control. So there were a couple different approaches to the employer mandate. In the House, they uh, did a sort of a traditional pay-for-play provision in their bill where they basically said, employers of a certain size, you either have to offer health insurance coverage to your employees or you have to pay, I think it was like a 6% payroll tax. Um, that's your choice. In the Senate, which is the version that ultimately became law, we said, well, we're going to let uh, employers have a choice here. They don't have to offer health insurance coverage if they don't want to. Um, but if they do, it has to meet these certain tests. Otherwise, we're going to allow your employees to go to the exchange and get a tax credit. And we basically said, you know, if, if you are offering coverage to those, you have to offer to all who are full-time employees, and you have to offer to the, the tax dependents. So we had to define in law, well, what does full-time mean? And full-time, the, the Congress made a decision, there's going to be 30 hours per week per month. Now, a lot of you are probably scratching your head going, wait, 30 hours a week is not full time. 40 hours a week is full time, right? So that is where this, uh, this concern comes into place, and this is exactly what the bill that the House is going to take up this week, and the Senate is likely to take it up um, either later this month or sometime in February would do, is it would simply change that definition from 30 hours to 40 hours. Um, and at least in the House, this is, well, actually in the House and the Senate, the, this legislation has been introduced on a bipartisan basis. So there's Republican and Democratic co-sponsors on the bill. The House actually voted on this bill last year and got a fair number of Democrats to go along with it. Um, and you know, the argument from those who support the legislation would say, look, um, by setting this standard at 30 hours instead of 40 hours, you're basically creating um, a situation, particularly in sort of lower wage industries with high turnover, like restaurants, hotels, hospitality, uh, construction, where employers are going to set your hours artificially below 30 hours per week. They don't have to offer you health insurance, but now you're going to have to go get a second job if you want to be able to make a living and provide for your family, right? And you're going to have to go buy health insurance through the exchange, which is fine because that's a new option for you under the law. Um, whereas if the threshold were set at 40 hours instead, you could work, you know, up to 39 and a half hours per week and not have to go get that second job and still have the opportunity to go get health insurance through the exchange. Now, there are many who oppose redefining from 30 to 40 because they're, they're worried for the exact reasons why, um, you know, Democrats set the, the threshold at 30 in the first place. They're worried that employers are going to dump. Uh, the vast majority of the American workforce is sort of working right around that 40-hour threshold, and if you raise it to 40, does that give an incentive to employers to dump? Now, the opposite, uh, the folks on the other side of that would say, look, employers were offering health insurance coverage to you know the vast majority of working Americans pre-ACA with no requirements whatsoever, and they were doing it because they wanted to recruit and retain a strong workforce. The ACA hasn't changed that. In fact, the 
economic uh, recovery means that you're going to have to work even harder to sort of recruit and retain a strong workforce. So you're going to hear a lot of these arguments over the next few weeks about whether it makes more sense to provide <laughs> employers and employees more flexibility to more work more hours and still go to the exchange and get credits, or should we keep it at 30 hours and sort of make sure you know employers, including those who are already offering coverage for the ACA, can't game the system. Ashley, would you like yeah, to add anything? Uh, no, that's <laughs> a great, um, you know, I, I think it, it'll be a, a good test balloon to see what happens on this one. Yeah. Great. Uh, so shifting to a little bit of a different topic, uh, we know that the funding for, uh, and this will be specifically directed toward, towards Ashley since I know she specializes in this uh, given her experience, but we know that uh, funding for uh, CHIP, uh, Children's Health Insurance Program, uh, is set to expire uh, if it's not reauthorized by October 1st. Um, so I was hoping that, you know, for those who aren't as familiar as you, if you could provide some, some history on the program and some of the key policy considerations that are sort of underscoring this, this debate. Sure, sure. I'll give you just a little bit of detail here um, and, uh, and apologies for not getting into a, a ton of weeds here. But, um, but the, the CHIP program, the Children's Health Insurance Program, um, was created, and Sarah reminded me, as part of budget reconciliation uh, legislation. The same bill that created the Medicare Physician Payment System that everybody That's wants right. to scrap <laughs> also created the Children's in Health Insurance Program. In 1997. Um, it, and it was a pretty bipartisan proposal. You know, who, can't, who can be against health insurance coverage for kids? Um, and kids are relatively inexpensive to insure. Um, and these are lower income kids. Um, so, um, so over time, uh, the program has changed a little bit, but its basic structure, you know, is designed to be a flexible program. Um, like Medicaid, CHIP is a state-based program, and so CHIP programs look different in different states. Um, I'm from Arkansas, ours was called Our Kids First. Um, so sometimes they have names that may not, you may not recognize as the Children's Health Insurance Program, but that's what it is. Um, and so they get some funding from the state and some funding from the federal government. Um, and over the years, we have um, done more at the federal level to, you know, say, provide in certain incentives or, um, or help states uh, that, that some states want to do certain things and, and want more flexibility, say, to cover adults in their CHIP program. Like, what about pregnant moms? Do we want to cover pregnant moms? So, um, so there are some, you know, pregnant women in some programs or even childless adults at one point in, in some states. So um, flexibility of how to structure your CHIP programs, how it interacts with private health insurance. Like maybe you want to go through private health insurance companies to actually provide the coverage as a third party administrator. Um, maybe you want to go more, um, you know, less through private and more through the state uh, Department of uh, Health. Uh, so. Um, so they all look very different, um, but they've been pretty effective in covering kids and pretty bipartisan over the years. The last time it was reauthorized was 2009, and actually it was a very contentious reauthorization. It took many, time, many tries. We had a couple of presidential vetoes by President Bush, um, and finally you know, came to a resolution for a 10-year reauthorization of the bill. Um, so the law is still intact, but the funding, um, and I think this was in an Affordable Care Act, uh, uh, provision, the funding for CHIP only goes through this current fiscal year, which ends at the end of September. So, um, if it expired after September, there wouldn't uh, the states wouldn't be able to access their funds for the program, um, which would would put them in a bind. And you know, what do you, how, how do you provide con continued coverage for kids? Um, and so, uh, you know, this was all pre-ACA. So now that the ACA is out there, how does it interact with these health insurance exchanges and in states that have expanded Medicaid, how does it uh, interact with the new Medicaid income thresholds? So there are a lot of policy questions. Um, I think it's a little less probably bipartisan than it has been in the past. Um, there have been questions over, you know, maybe we want to just give a temporary funding uh, extension, just straight extension, no frills, uh, no major changes, and kind of look at what's going on out there in terms of coverage, who's getting covered where, and where are their gaps? Um, others want to really look at, you know, they, they think, you know, we're really ready to, to talk about how this interacts with the ACA and uh, do more of a, a full reauthorization or do a shorter period, like one year of funding increase, and then really tackle the reauthorization. So, um, 
you know, Congress uh, sometimes acts at the 11th hour, <laughs> as you may know. Um, so I wouldn't be at all surprised if this goes on until, you know, the debate will really heat up this spring and summer and um, probably, you know, something will happen before the end of September. But it just... Yeah, although what's interesting about, you know, doing something on the CHIP program to extend the funding is that, as Ashley said, this is a state program. Um, the states get to decide how to design their program within the constraints of the law. And states are on a different timeline, budgeting timeline, than the federal government is. So you've got a, not, a lot of newly ex, uh, elected state legislatures who may only be in session for the first four or five months of the year and are going to be making their budgeting decisions. And if by April or May they don't know for sure whether this funding is still going to exist, it makes it very difficult for them to plan. So that's why there is some pressure to do something on this CHIP program potentially in tandem with something on the Medicare position payment legislation that we talked about. Yeah, so it would be interesting if these start to, I mean, there are deadlines, and these deadlines will, pre, will push the agenda, like SGR. You know, if you don't, if you don't f deal with SGR in some way, even a temp another temporary patch, doctors will get a 20, I think it's 21% cut starting in April. So guess what? You know, they're going to do something. It'll probably be on March 28th or, you know, right at the final finish line. Um, maybe it's even a short-term patch thinking, um, you know, four or five months, thinking, oh, we'll just roll this all in. That's kind of our theory, that we'll roll this all in together in a big package in, let's say, July, right before the August recess, or maybe even in September when they come back into session. Um, so that's a possibility. And then who knows, ACA could get pulled in. It, it's almost hard to, I, think, I would think, unless you do a straight uh, funding extension, it's almost hard to not touch ACA if you're going to uh, to deal with CHIP, aside from a straight funding, because they're kind of intricately linked at this point. Uh, so it'll be very interesting to watch. Great. Um, I want to touch on something that Sarah brought up, uh, particularly about the budget, budget reconciliation um, as a possible vehicle for healthcare changes. I was wondering if you could perhaps you know, provide some insight on how this would work and what are some of the considerations outside you know, of CHIP that, you know, would involve health policy in a foreseeable reconciliation bill. So how many of you have actually heard of budget reconciliation before? Okay, a couple of you. So reconciliation is basically a fancy way of saying uh, provide fast track authority to get a piece of legislation to the president's desk uh, more quickly and with fewer votes required in the Senate. So. The way the concept sort of came about was when the Congressional Budget Act was written back in 1974, so you know, it just celebrated its 40th birthday. Um, there was this feeling that there needed to be a process in place um, to get, you know, so first Congress in March takes up what's called a budget resolution. And a budget resolution is a big document that at very high levels kind of spells out, here's how much we're gonna spend, here's how much we're gonna take in in tax revenue for the year. Um, and it includes a number of other bells and whistles, but essentially, if you're able to get a budget resolution through both chambers and conference it, those sort of spending and revenue levels are then enforced throughout the remainder of that year um, through various what are called budget points of order. Well, one of the things you can do in a budget resolution is you can include a, what's called a reconciliation instruction. And a reconciliation instruction essentially does three things. It says, which committees you want to reconcile, the amount you want to reconcile them by, and the date by which you want them to reconcile. So for example, you could include a reconciliation instruction in a budget resolution that says, hey, Senate Finance Committee, we want you to reduce the deficit by $5 billion, and you need to report out your legislation book by July 31st of this year. So the Finance Committee goes, writes its bill to reduce the, the deficit by $5 billion, um, and then that piece of legislation gets fast-track consideration in the Senate where you really only need the simple majority to pass it. Ordinarily in the Senate, you need 60 votes to pass anything. So this is a big deal for anybody who uh, is living in a world where their party doesn't have 60 votes to control and would like to get a piece of legislation through. Although I will also note that reconciliation has also been used in a bipartisan fashion many times in the past as well. It's not necessarily a, a partisan uh, exercise and a partisan vehicle. But there is some discussion that um, Republicans would like to use the reconciliation process this year, and we'll know in sort of March when they write up their budget resolutions where they're headed with this, 
to do a variety of things. It could be to make changes to the Affordable Care Act, and there are a variety of things that they could, that would be allowable under the reconciliation rules, such as repealing the individual mandate, making changes to the employer mandate, repealing the medical device excise tax, um, scaling back the Medicaid expansion. You want to change the generosity of the and premium tax credits that were allowed in the ECA. You could do that in a reconciliation vehicle. Um, there are rules around what you can and can't do in a reconciliation vehicle, but they're relatively easy to meet. I mean, there are things like whatever you do has to have a budgetary impact because the whole point of a reconciliation process is to make changes to align with a budget number. So you got to have a budgetary impact on whatever you do. And the vast majority of provisions in the Affordable Care Act do have a budgetary impact, so you could make changes to them. There's also a requirement that you can't do anything that reduces the deficit outside of the budget window, which is generally about 10 years. This is why, I don't know if any of you are familiar with the Bush tax cuts that were enacted through reconciliation in 2001 and 2003, but when we had this big debate about the fiscal cliff a couple of years ago, that's because the 0103 Bush tax cuts had to be expired because they were in a reconciliation vehicle and they would have reduced the deficit outside the 10-year window. So there are some constraints, um, but there are also some opportunities if, for example, Republicans aren't successful in making this change, although they are trying to do it in a bipartisan way, but if they're not successful in getting this 30 to 40 hours change we were talking about earlier, that might be a candidate for then let's take a step back and include it in a reconciliation vehicle. <coughs> Another reason you might want to have a reconciliation instruction and use um, a reconciliation vehicle in the healthcare context is are any of you familiar with this big Supreme Court case that's coming up in July, King v. Burwell? Big deal, basically, if, if, it, if it goes against the administration. It, if you live in a state that has a federally facilitated marketplace for these health insurance exchanges, you will no longer be eligible for a tax credit, potentially. That would be a big triggering point, I think, for both parties to potentially make some very <coughs> substantial changes to the ACA to sort of fix the problem and allow for tax credits across all states, including the federally facilitated ones. If you have a reconciliation instruction at your disposal, that might be a great vehicle through which you could sort of quickly, on a fast track basis, get a piece of legislation through that made some fixes. Now, you'd be constrained, of course, to only things that make budgetary changes, but those are the kinds of things you could use reconciliation for. And of course, there's also some discussion about using reconciliation potentially for tax reform. So. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll throw that out there too. You know, that's not our subject for today. And one big political question here is, you know, do you want do you want to send something to the president that is, you know, really hard for him to veto because there's some a lot of really good stuff in it. You could put extending the debt limit into the reconciliation bill. The debt limit is something that Congress hates to have to deal with, but basically it's you know, making sure that we can pay the obligations that we already have, spending obligations, um, the debt limit has to be raised. It, it doesn't play very well, uh, I think, with the American public because they think, we don't want to increase our debt. Um, so it just, it's, it's not a vote that members like to have to, to take, um, but it is something that could be included in a reconciliation bill. Um, and you know various other things. I mean, you know, I think there, there. I, I do think you know the White House has. You know, I think they would veto a bill that repeals the ACA. I mean, clearly, you know, we know they would veto it. Congress doesn't have the super majority to override the veto. Um, but would they veto something that makes a couple minor changes? We'll we'll see about this uh, 30, 40 hour week and how that plays out. But um, but as as Sarah mentioned, Congress also has to pass the budget resolution first. So keep in mind, you know, in the 40-year history of the Budget Act, nine years we've had no budget, no budget conference agreement passed, and f five of the last five years um, is counted in that. So, so in the last five years, you know, we had this Murray-Ryan budget deal. That was not a budget uh, conference agreement. That was not a budget re resolution, um, which is, as Sarah said, kind of the blueprint that lays out um, what the budget is. So. Um, this might be the first year in five years that we'll have an actual budget resolution. Mm -hmm. Are you optimistic? I'm very optimistic. I think yeah. when both parties, the same party controls both chambers, it's a lot easier to get a budget resolution through. Um, but there will definitely still be some challenges. I mean, even within you know, each chamber's representation within their own party, there are some pretty significant differences in viewpoints. So 
you've got to get you know the moderate Republicans together with the more conservative Republicans and get them on the same page, which can be difficult. But I expect that they will be able to conference budget resolutions. Okay, now switching to uh, one particular um, initiative that has been ripe for bipartisanship. Uh, I'd like to focus on the 21st Century Cures uh, work that's been going on. And for those who aren't familiar, uh, 21st Century Cures uh, is in the House Energy and Commerce uh, Committee, uh, chaired by um, Fred Upton. Um, and what it's focused on is the discovery, development, and delivery of critical treatments and uh, technologies for patients uh, in the 21st century. So Sarah briefly mentioned to modernizing the FDA. Um, one particular area that is my focus on at BPC um, is advancing a regulatory oversight framework for health IT. So um, I'll let the panelists talk a little bit more about that, but this will sort of provide regulatory um, clarification for anything from Fitbits, which I don't know if any of you have, are wearing now, to clinical decision support tools, to electronic health records. Um, so, you know, at BPC, we've been working closely with legislators and staff on these issues, um, and there are uh, two bills, one in the House, one in the Senate, that have definitely um, aligned with BPC's recommendations on this topic. Um, and I wanted to gain the panel's insight about where do they see um, the 21st Century Cures Initiative, what might we see out of it. There has been talk about a broader package, but also some smaller things, and so if you could, could lend your perspective. Sure, yeah, I think this will be, um, at least as the way the energy and commerce has been looking at this, it's a very broad initiative, you know, definitely how can we bring drugs and, uh, and medical devices to market faster is one big question, but obviously, you know, patient safety is a big part of that equation. Uh, so you want to be able to bring those things to market and, and foster innovation, but you don't want to kill people and harm people in the process. So you have to, you know, there is a process. Um, the question is, does it sort of, um, does it work for today's um, technologies and, and drugs and devices and sort of the way things work today? And, and there have been, uh, the president had a commission that uh, provides some recommendations. Um, the um, 21st Century Cures has had a uh, whole number of stakeholders from just basically every sector come in and, and provide their recommendations. So they're doing a lot of uh, due diligence and listening. It's been very bipartisan. Um, I think we'll see the same in the Senate uh, with Senator Alexander at the HELP Committee and, uh, and Senator Murray and, and may see some things come out of that committee. Um, there's certainly an interest in FDA reform. Um, I mean, this tends to be kind of one of those examples of, oh, you know, look at the Food and Drug Administration. It's this kind of typical, bureaucratic, slow-moving thing. Uh, but, you know, I, I think there are some examples even of the centers within, um, within FDA where there are some that, um, there are some expedited, expedited processes in place that are working fairly well um, and maybe some areas where they could, could use improvement. So it's not completely black and white. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. We are very interested, as John Michael said, in the um, mobile technologies and health IT piece of this. So one of the big policy questions here is uh, health information technology, health IT. These are things like medical records, electronic medical records, um, uh, clinical decision support tools. So these are things like, um, uh, you know, let's say a, a doctor has an iPad in the room, at, you know, during uh, <laughs> during surgery or during a, uh, some kind of a, a screening that walks you through different uh, types of medical decisions based on the literature and the evidence. Um, clearly, a little bit higher risk when you are in terms of patient safety when you're, you know, there with a patient who's receiving treatment. Uh, versus, uh, John Michael mentioned the Fitbit. You know, we a lot of time we have these wearable devices, or maybe we have mobile apps. And I think there are hundreds, maybe thousands, at this point, of apps we can put on our phones to do everything from you know help us lower our weight or increase our steps or whatever we want to do, better sleep. <laughs> um, so you know that's pretty low risk. Um, but there's a lot in the middle, and so we talk a little bit about um, we want to make sure that those. Uh, things that are really high risk, um, and uh, clinical decision support is a little bit of a gray area too, um, depending on how it's used and depending on you know who makes the ultimate decision. Um, but there are uh, there are some things that are very clearly medical devices. You know, if something's going to um, you know 
going to change your blood glucose, your insulin, your blood glucose uh, pump if you have diabetes. I mean, that's, that's something you want to get right. You don't want to get that wrong. Um, so there are certain things that need to be regulated by the Food and Drug Administration. There's a question of uh, other types of things, and certainly electronic medical records. Um, you know, we have another agency called ONC. This is one of those names I just can't get my head around, but um, the Office of the National Coordinator for Health IT, and it's under the Department of Health and Human Services, just as FDA is. It's a very small office. It was actually established by President Bush and then uh, funded in 2009 in the Recovery Act. But, um, you know, its job is to um, promote uh, the use of health IT. And um, I mean, that's a whole other, you know, we've kind of, we've come a little um, farther in terms of physicians and hospitals adopting health IT, um, much of which has been because we're paying incentives for them to do that. Um, they're gonna start getting penalized if they don't meaningfully use health IT. This is only physicians and hospitals. Um, it was only restricted to those two kind of groups. Um, will start getting penalized if they're not uh, meeting the requirements for health for using health IT. Uh, they call it meaningful use, and there's uh, all kinds of pages upon pages of regulations that define what meaningful use of health IT is. Um, we've spent, I want to say, um, 17 billion, uh, 27 billion, I think, on health IT um, spent, and yet, you know, you're still having problems with what we call interoperability the ability of one health IT system to talk to another health IT system. You know, we want to be able to have different vendors and different products out there, um, but they need to be able to talk to each other. It's not going to be a lot of uh, good in terms of, you know, when I leave the hospital and I go see my doctor, the hospital and the doctor need, their systems need to be able to communicate with one another. We um, have a long way to go on interoperability. And actually Congress has recognized this. and. Um, I think this is another example of bipartisanship and the, um, the cromnibus, <laughs> the spending bill at the end of last year, um, and in both the House and Senate um, uh, labor, health and, sh uh, health and human services appropriations bills this year, um, there was some language saying, look, you guys, you know, uh, you guys meaning healthcare providers and health IT vendors, these companies, um, you can't block information. You can't say, okay, this is proprietary. You know, yes, we can have these different products and they can be proprietary, um, but the standards used to uh, be interoperable, interoperable are not proprietary. Um, and so shame on you for, for blocking information. Um, the Office of the National Coordinator, ONC, should have the ability to, uh, to put a stop to that. Um, because we really haven't come as far as we should have come. $27 billion, and what do we really have to show for it? Um, health IT, the promise of health IT was not just that, um, uh, that it can improve care, but just make care more efficient. I mean, think about these vaults of you know, paper files and fax machines, and, and that, to all of us in this room, seems just you know, 100 years ago. Uh, but that's still kind of the case in some ways. You might have your electronic medical records, but you still got the big vault with your paper files. Um, so we're really not there yet, but we've come a long way. Um, and we're pushing both interoperability and you know, this concept of who needs to be regulating these things. And how can we put something into law that's not so rigid that it won't bend when technologies change? Um, but can also um, provide a framework that protects patient safety and um, doesn't kind of scare people away from the market. We want people to innovate and enter this market. Um, so that's my, that's my take. Great, thank you. Sarah, would you like to add anything? Yeah. No? And she covered the <laughs> landscape. <laughs> okay. Um, so before uh, I open it up uh, really quickly, I'll let you both sort of provide sort of last comments on what you see anything that's true to your heart about, you know, what you hope to see in the future in the new Congress or, so I'll, I'll start with Sarah. What I hope to see yeah. in the new Congress. Um, well, my hopes are probably different from what I think will actually <laughs> happen. What I actually <laughs> think will happen <laughs> is probably still remarkably little, but my one caveat is if the Supreme Court case goes against the administration's viewpoint on, um, in, in that'll come out probably late June, early July, I think there could be a big opportunity here 
um, for potentially some changes to the ACA, um, potentially. So <coughs> pay attention to that date. Um, as far as other major healthcare legislation, I mean, we've kind of touched on they're going to have something on the SGR, they're going to have something on CHIP. Um, I'm still going to predict those are going to be small things, not big things. Um, I think the 21st century cures uh, debate, um, they've done a lot of, you know, laying of the groundwork in the House. There's going to be a lot of gr laying of the groundwork in the Senate this year. But I think what we're really doing is setting up for the next reauthorization of what are called the UFAs, the medical device and the prescription drug manufacturing user fees. Um, we've got to reauthorize those laws, and I think a lot of these ideas are going to get mm -hmm. sort of pulled out, put into that framework, which probably means we won't have action until sometime in 2016 on those things. But there's a couple of other things around the edges that, you know, I'm keeping an eye out for. I think people are getting increasingly interested in things like, what do we do about the long-term care challenge in this country? I think there are folks who are interested in getting a better handle on things like uh, fraud in the healthcare system, whether we're talking about the Medicare program, the Medicaid program, even within the ACA context. Um, the other thing I think we're going to start seeing a ramp up and in interest in is um, there was a provision in the ACA that's been on the back burner because it doesn't start till 2018 called the Cadillac tax. And it is essentially a non-deductible excise tax on employer-sponsored coverage that kicks in if you're above certain values. A lot of employers are starting to wake up and realize, oh, I didn't think this was going to apply to me. It is going to apply to me. I got to start reining in my health care costs, which in some, some cases means narrower provider networks. It's going to mean things like uh, shifting costs to employees. There was a very interesting article, I think it was in the New York Times yesterday, about Harvard. Harvard's making changes to its employee employee plan and all the Harvard professors are upset because now they're paying a $250 deductible um, for their health insurance that's coming here. Um, the sort of the rules uh, for that tax are going to start to get released this year. I think you're going to see a lot of activity and interest in wanting to work on that and maybe make some changes. So mm -hmm. that's a, sort of my predictions for the year. Um, sure. I think uh, when we have certainly at BPC an interest in long-term care as well and, and think that will, t will grow as our baby boomer population ages and more and more people are faced with this, wait a minute, Medicare doesn't cover long-term care? A lot of people don't know that. Medicare does not cover long-term care. Um, so what happens is either you have long-term care insurance, which very few people do, it's a very small market or you spend down your assets into Medicaid, or you may be very wealthy and you can pay for long-term care yourself. I mean, this is when you, know, you get older or your parent gets older and they need help with daily activities of living, like bathing and dressing and transportation. And uh, people want to remain in their own homes. They typically don't want to go to a nursing home. I know I don't. Um, and so how do we do that? And how do we pay for it? And how do we make sure it's good quality care? And that will become more and more an issue. I wish it would be a little bit more on the front burner, um, but I think this is one of those things where it, it, it will become more and more of a crisis. We're spending more money, you know, and fewer and more people are noticing they don't have access to services and they can't afford it. Um, and as it becomes more of a crisis, Congress will focus more on it. Um, but, but we do want to see that. We're putting out some recommendations late this year on long-term care. Um, you know, I think I agree with Sarah. I think I, I think little will happen in terms of what gets over the finish line. Um, what I hope to see um, is a little bit of a rebuilding of trust and the the ability to um, do some honest brokering, even if if it's on a couple of really small provisions. And maybe this tw 30, 40 hour work week is one of them. But just um, you know, there's been a lot of kind of bad blood and, and maybe the new Congress um, will come in with, you know, I think it's kind of gotten more and more polarized, obviously, uh, in the last couple of election waves. But, um, but I think there are some people, uh, members on both sides of the aisle, both sides of the Capitol, who want to get things done. And that's what we like to see. That's what we like to promote. Um, we, t we convene a lot of times healthcare staff even, just so they can kind of get to know each other. Uh, legislative directors or you know healthcare staff, um, you know it's important to be able to just have a civil conversation and listen to one another. So um, that's something I hope to see more of. And I think you know at the early in the early days of this Congress, clearly you know I think a lot of members feel American 
public has spoken. Uh, we want a Republican majority. That Republican majority will want to really make its stamp. And so that may seem you know, very partisan early on. Um, but I think that, that there are a lot of members who, you know, when they're facing potentially really tough reelection bids in 2016, um, which is a presidential year, and um, they want to get some things done. They want to get some points on the board. So, you know, you don't want to be so partisan that you can't go home to your constituents and kind of say, well, you know, well, sorry, we, you know, I stood for my principles, but we didn't really get anything done. So, um, so I think you will see some members uh, keeping 2016 in mind and um, focusing on being productive. And I hope to see that. I, you know, I hope that, that we will see some, some good, uh, good debates going on and some constructive things getting over the finish line. Great. So we have about 30 minutes left. So I'd like to open it up to the floor for any questions. It looks like we have two mics on the side for questions. Is that? Yeah. A brave soul. Can you hear me? Yes. Seema Gupta, Hofstra University. This is regarding EMR and health IT. I noticed when we first came into um, this uh, seminar, the students, young students who are very familiar and very used to grown up with technology were encouraged to use longhand and keep their laptops out of this um, auditorium because it's distracting. So um, I know EMR is going to be government mandated and there are a lot of physicians, America's best physicians in their 40s, 50s and 60s who are having a very hard time with EMR. And just to put in a simple EKG, they're spending hours. Instead of focusing on the patient, they're focusing on typing in a simple EKG or a simple blood test. How do you feel about training these physicians? How do you feel about the government training these physicians or paying for scribes to help these physicians out? Since EMR is government mandated, I would think a training system would be great. How do you feel about that? I can um, speak to that a little bit, but feel free to jump in, John Michael, because sure. I know you've sat in a lot of these rooms. We've had many conversations um, with groups from this size to just, you know, uh, around uh, the table talking about this issue because you're right. I mean, providers are complaining. Sometimes the product that they're using is a little clunky. Um, sometimes they've got a great product, but, but they, f they still feel like it's getting in the way of this interaction with the patient. And here we are trying to provide these incentives to provide more care coordination and more, um, you know, better quality care, better patient experience. And yet the doctor is kind of sitting there not looking at you and just typing everything in. And, you know, so we do. We hear that. Um, you know, I, um, I think the issue of training has come up and has been called for. I mean, I think the question is, um, is who does it and who pays for it? And um, you know this always, you know, a lot of times is the issue with public with policy and um, ONC. Most of its funding for grant programs has pretty much run out. That was 2009 in the Recovery Act. Had a number of grant programs, did some good things, uh, but it's pretty much run out. Um, you do have some examples. Uh, one was called the Beacon Community Program, uh, that was funded by a grant through um, the Recovery Act at ONC. And these were, these were communities that were using health IT to improve care delivery. Um, and then, you know, we kind of, they worked on these programs for a few years and looked back at you know, what worked. Um, I think what, um, what I hope that these doctors uh, do who are really feeling frustrated and feeling the crunch is to look to some of those who've kind of figured it out and kind of a, a learning collaborative um, format and, and, and sit down and, and kind of learn from each other and peer to peer. There's probably more that the, the administration, HHS, can do to help facilitate that. I think that's happening in some areas, um, but it can happen organically. I think it can happen in the private sector if, um, if providers start to really look at, well, okay, you know, we're really struggling with this. There's gotta be other people who 
you know, are struggling with it and figuring it out and how do we kind of partner together to do that. You have to think about, um, you know, you might be competitors in a geographic area, so you got to be able to put that aside and sit down and still be able to work together. Uh, but we haven't solved the interoperability thing either, and I think that's going to be, um, you know, we still have obviously a lot more work to do. Yeah, and we just hosted, so before, I think it was December 17th, so if you look on our, our website, somebody yeah. specifically just asked that question. We, you know, at BPC, we hold events that, um, you know, engage stakeholders from across the spectrum. And we had somebody ask that exact question. So I would encourage you to check out our webcast on that. I would love to answer it now uh, in further detail, but I just want to give, you know, enough people the time to ask questions. But I thank you for your question. A lot of um, excellent doctors are retiring early um, in their 60s and you know the best doctors in America some of the best doctors in the world and I'm very optimistic for the 21st century as you said yeah. so thank you Absolutely. so I guess we'll switch to the side of the room hi Brandy Bacon with Harvard University Extension School and my question is specifically you talked about chip in some of the state-ran programs with the ACA are the big topics right now are like children um, autism increasing significantly and mental health especially with all the shootings I'm actually from Marysville Washington so you guys are probably familiar with that um, so is there anything federally to protect the children the mental health programs in states that don't necessarily have the funding or don't include that Question. Yeah, that is a really good question. And you may recall that as part of the Affordable Care Act, um, there was a provision um, called the essential health benefits. And one of the essential health benefits that has to be required in any uh, health insurance product that's sold on the individual or the small group marketplace um, has to include behavioral health benefits. So. You know, and that is how, how that is defined is sort of left up to some extent to the states. So the states do have some role in deciding what is the essential health benefit benchmark plan. They get to choose that for their state. But typically it's like, you know, the largest Blue Cross Blue Shield plan in your state, for example, or the one that your state employees are enrolling in. Um, so there were some additional um, sort of requirements uh, included in the Affordable Care Act. Um, we also passed not that long ago the Mental Health Parity Act, um, which you know ensures um, that for you know in large employer plans, mental health benefits are provided as well. Mm -hmm. And Senator Domenici, who's at BPC, played a big role in that and cares a lot about this. We have um, we right now have a also a, a retirement security initiative, but as part of that, we're also looking at the Social Security Disability Insurance Program. And this issue has come up. We're putting out a report in um, probably at this point in the fall on um, retirement security, but also looking at SSDI. This is part of Social Security, but you know, benefits for people with disabilities. Um, and this issue has come up of a, a, you know, a huge growing uh, population of people with autism that are, um, that are receiving benefits and kind of you know, thinking about the implications of that. Um, and, you know, the, I mean, I think this is, it, it comes back to a funding issue. It comes back to, you know, what's the, really the role of states. Um, the, a lot of these battles have been fought at the state level when it comes to health insurance benefit mandates because those are determined, you know, the insurance commissioner and the state legislatures. And autism has been one that many state uh, advocates have fought and won at the state level. Um, others have fought and lost because there's fear that it's going to, you know, be this huge expensive benefit. Um, but now with, with essential health benefits, it does provide some protections depending on how the state implements it. Um, but you're right, I think, you know, there's probably a, a couple places where it falls short. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, my name's Stephanie Martins, also from Harvard. And um, so a lot has been said about reducing government spending on health care, but do you foresee any major changes in regulating the pricing for, like, as far as cost of care? Because, for example, now in Massachusetts, one CAT scan is $7,000. A blood test is 500 And even if you have insurance through your employer, the out-of-pocket cost is too expensive. And to me, that seems to be the biggest problem. Uh, the out-of-pocket cost, yeah. 
No, I, I mean, mean the, the cost of treatment. Yeah, the cost of treatment. Absolutely. And Massachusetts has sort of been leading the way because obviously, <laughs> you know, you passed a, you know a universal sort of you know opportunity to purchase health insurance coverage. Mm -hmm. You had an exchange before exchanges were even right. cool. Um, <laughs> And then you, you know, the second step was sort of okay. Now we've got to rein in healthcare cost growth, and you guys have been doing some very interesting stuff in Massachusetts. I think there is a lot of interest in at the federal level in getting to that next step as well. Um, but there are some significant differences, and as you all know, I mean, healthcare is very local, and what you know, prices in some areas of the country. I'll throw out North Dakota since I used to work for a senator from North Dakota are very low on a per capita basis compared to, say, Miami, where costs seem to be very high per capita. And so the strategies for how to rein in healthcare cost growth in one area of the country may not work in another area of the country. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of interest in sort of grappling with that geographic variation issue. There are a lot mm -hmm. of folks who think that making delivery system reforms to mm -hmm. incentivize whether it's bundled payments or, you know, there's some who would like to move to a premium support model in the Medicare program mm -hmm. where, you know, we're going to subsidize um, a certain level of health insurance coverage, and if you want more than that, you're going to have to pay for it as, you know, somebody who's over 65. There are a lot of those ideas that are sort of percolating, mm -hmm. um, and we are probably, especially since overall budget deficits have been going down the last <laughs> few years, are probably a good three, four, five years away from really getting serious about tackling those problems again. All right, thank you. Hi, I'm Danielle Dadabo from Suffolk University in Boston. And um, with all the recent discussion about federal healthcare data and health IT, do you feel that this could open any doors for any HIPAA violations with um, hackers or any um, making the health information more accessible? I knew this would come up. <laughs> this always comes up. Um, and some people think it's um, HIP is in place and is working. And I think some people think, and this is, again, feel free to chime in, um, you know, some people think it, um, let's not use the, um, the threat of privacy violation as a way to not, to halt our progress on, um, on health IT. Um, at the same time, we've got to make sure patients' uh, data is secure. I mean, it's just, it's, it's absolutely uh, hugely imperative, and, and, and we can certainly understand why people are concerned about it. Um, you know, there are a lot of um, bells and whistles and all of the regulations that deal with health IT meaningful use that make sure that, you know, that those safeguards are in place in terms of the, the standards that those vendors have to meet. Um, you know, so yeah, I think this will continue to be a policy question. Is it enough? Is it too much? Um, you know, because if you if you kind of put too many constraints, um, you can sort of slow down that slow down the process. But um, but clearly, you know, there's a lot of concern, rightly so. I just got an email from Target telling me, <laughs> you know, uh, that uh, I was part of yet another data breach, and uh, you know, so so it's something that is is not going to go away anytime soon. Um, Michael, any other? Sure. I mean, I'd, I'd like to just sort of add some insight in terms of, you know, the particularly in terms of federal health data, since we at BPC have sort of issued a, uh, a brief on that. And, and when you're talking about federal health data is the nation's, you know, largest single payer um, and sort of the data that they collect, they've since, you know, the, you know, Obama ad administration have, you know, participated in what they're calling their open government initiative. Um, and so they, CMS um, has been going through particular processes of releasing certain types of de-identified data, um, which, um, you know, researchers, um, you know, clinicians, anybody can get access to, um, you know, if you go through the necessary protocols. Um, so a lot of the data that's being released on the federal level is they're doing a very, very very good job in, ter in terms of making sure it's protected. It's all de-identified de and the, the process to actually obtain access to the data um, is, is pretty difficult. So it's, um, you know, you have to go through an institutional review board um, and it, you have to sort of state your purpose, what you're gonna do with the data and then what happens afterwards. Um, and I think that um, that sort of 
one little sliver of opening up, you know, the source of data that CMS has begun to, um, is somehow spearheading a lot of these like threats about like data breaches. But as Ashley mentioned, HIPAA is 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 working, um, and so I think a lot of the threats are are sort of unwarranted um, in terms of of health data. Thank you. Mm. I'm Philip Sefer from the Harvard Extension School. Uh, last summer, I worked for a medical journal in Boston and uh, doing our interviews with healthcare professionals and some of the doctors we worked with, uh, an issue came up very often and that's the ever increasing and very high uh, rate of malpractice and, and generally mistakes and errors in many of the major hospitals in the US. Uh, and we tried to get hold of some data and, and kind of, uh, which would be very helpful, especially for patients as well when choosing which hospital to maybe conduct a certain operation at. Uh, but it's very difficult to get hold of any data because of privacy issues. Are there any plans to open up uh, any kind of a repository online with maybe some kind of anonymized data on, on, on the success rate and, and, and malpractice rate at different institutions? Thank you. Actually, yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, this is always a contentious policy issue, malpractice reform. and. You know, um, I, I think there's a lot of recognition that there are um, uh, there are a lot of malpractice issues, and a lot of providers worry that as more and more quality metrics uh, come into play, uh, that there's more likelihood that those types of things can happen. Um, so, um, you know, this it came up during during health reform, and I think uh, very quickly <laughs> was taken off the table. Um, you know, people kind of point to states that have, that have done um, comprehensive malpractice reform and kind of what have been the impacts, has it lowered costs, has it really had that effect, um, and how do you do it, and could you, could you take some state examples and learn from those and maybe um, apply those to other states? I think your idea of, of the data, and I wasn't as aware of this, just not having that data accessible um, is an interesting idea. I mean, I think that's it's definitely something you could you know could look into more and, and maybe do some writing on. But um, uh, it would be just I think uh, it, more more information on this is is what we keep kind of coming back around to. Well, you know, how is it really going to you know if our goal is to improve quality of care and care outcomes and meet these quality metrics and ultimately you know provide better value of care. Um, and better patient experience. Again, it's not just about uh, the provider, hopefully, um, ticking off these boxes of, oh, I've met these you know, 20 things to do. It's more about um, that patient experience of care. And you know, in, in my own personal opinion, I, I would think and I would hope that that improving the experience of care and let's say the medical home model or the accountable care model or these other types of of models where you're coordinating care better that um, you might have less instance of that. You know, people get to know their doctors more and, and sometimes that isn't the case today. Um, so, but I'd be interested in hearing more about the, the data accessibility issue. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, uh, Steven Erickson from Hofstra University. You mentioned earlier about Congress possibly changing the employer mandate from 30 hours to 40 hours. Don't you think that would be more detrimental, though, because most of the people that are working 40 hours would be the ones that actually need the insurance and would be supporting a family rather than 30 hours? Not saying every, it doesn't fit everybody, of course, but a lot of people that do work, the minimum hours may just be you know, a kid in school or something. Yeah, so the argument that, that folks who support moving from 30 to 40 will make to that is they'll point to the fact that, look, before the Affordable Care Act was ever enacted into law, over 160 million Americans were getting health insurance from their employers, right? And those folks were working at, you know, some of them were full-time, some of them were part-time, you know, most employers didn't really define what full-time was. Um, there wasn't, a, you know, any other law and statute that sort of designated what full-time was. The 30-hour threshold from moving 30 to 40, people will argue, all those employers who were offering health insurance before are going to continue offering health insurance um, because they were offering it to recruit and retain a strong workforce. 
what you will allow is those employers who maybe are in low margin industries in this country or have lower wage workers for whom maybe they weren't providing health insurance previously and to be able to offer coverage to this, a significant new number of employees, they either it's either unaffordable to the employer and they're gonna have to raise the prices for whatever product or service they're producing uh, or they're gonna have to lower the value of the overall healthcare benefit that they were providing to that subset of employees that they were providing health insurance coverage to. And because of the construct of this employer mandate that's in the law, they can already avoid paying that or avoid providing health insurance by keeping hours below 30, right? So the argument folks will make is if we allow employers to have flexibility to set a full-time definition that's, you know, at a range of anywhere below 40, that will give employers the flexibility to continue offering coverage if they were already offering coverage before, make a decision to set an hour lower, um, allow their employees to work, work more hours and not have to go get a second job. And you know, under either scenario, whether they're held at 25 hours or whether they're held at 39 and a half hours from the employee's perspective, um, I can work more hours and either way I'm going to the health insurance exchange and I've got you know, the opportunity to, to potentially get a premium tax credit to offset my own self-purchase coverage. That's the argument that they would make. Okay, thank you. But it's a fair point that you know, in this country the vast majority of workers are at 40 hours and there is a sort of underlying suspicion, I don't know that it's a fair suspicion, but that there's an underlying <coughs> suspicion that if you raise the definition of 40, you're going to have a lot of employers who were offering health insurance coverage previously, especially as they're looking down the pike to the Cadillac tax coming online, well, maybe we will, you know, think about dropping coverage or dropping hours for a certain subset of our workforce. Thank you. Hi, my name is Rachel Duran and I'm also from Hofstra. Um, my question has to do with something that Ms. Ridlon said actually at the end of the panel. She said that um, she has a lot of optimism basically for the upcoming Congress because of the next election cycle that these um, Congress people are gonna have to go back to their districts and say, you know, this is what I got done and it doesn't look as good to stand by your principles. However, because it's a presidential election cycle with no incumbent, do you think that that is going to make comp them look weak if they compromise on health care or do you think there's something about health care that makes compromise okay in the eyes of like a voter or the public it's a good question i you know i think and one big question is um what would a replacement of the affordable care act look like and that would kind of be a big idea thing i mean a, re a full wholesale replacement of the affordable care act that says strike everything repeal it and then replace it with this probably going to get vetoed by the president. You know, that's not one of those little things that's a big idea thing. Um, but absolutely, in a lot of districts, that's going um, to uh, really make people feel like, yes, you're, you know, you went to Washington, um, we, we voted you in to do this, and you did it, and you came back, and, and don't care as much about, you know, getting that across the finish line. Um, but I think the calculation will be made by a subset of members. So I don't think this is going to be like a, a wave necessarily uh, by a subset of members um, who will want to, yes, they'll talk about the bigger idea things, maybe even be the author of the replace thing, but they may behind the scenes say, okay, you know, this is what I, I want to push and I believe in and they're going to talk about it and they're going to go home and talk about it, but they may also um, try to strike deals and try to negotiate on some of these smaller issues because ultimately, um, you know, every member is going to go home and say, you know, I contributed to these laws or amendments that got across the finish line, and all of them will have something. But um, so yeah, I think there will be a subset. But you're right; I mean, it is it is that calculation. And I think you know, after we didn't really talk about this, but after let's say. Um, June of this year, maybe into August and September, you know, the, the presidential candidates are going to really be going strong and, um, and we'll start hearing about presidential platforms and so the focus will turn a lot to these big ideas. So I think, you know, if anything small is going to happen, it's going to be before, you know, fall um, and then it really will be, you know, where do we go from here in a big way. I do want to amplify one point though. I mean, you raise a really good issue that 
Um, if you look over the last 20 to 30 years, um, the sort of level of partisanship um, that has grown in each congressional district. I mean, the number of congressional districts that exist today that have elected a Republican congressperson but also went for Obama, or vice versa, you know, Democratic congressman from a district that voted for Romney. I mean, it's such a teeny tiny sliver of congressional districts. We've just become more partisan. Part of that has to do with redistricting, part of it has to do with just the mood of the country overall. So there is a lot of pressure, um, you know, as these members of Congress, some of them are in very comfortable districts where they're not worried about being primary, but some of them are very worried about being primary, either on the left or on the right, which is where it's that group that sort of makes compromise more difficult because they're, they are very worried about, you know, working with the other side of the aisle to find compromise. So that is definitely a dynamic that has sort of, I don't know, I don't know if it's grown or shifted, but it seemed, seemed noticeable to me over the last 15 years. Thank you. So we've reached two o'clock. So that concludes the panel. Uh, please join me in, in thanking our panelists for the great discussion.